the original impetus was how do you democratize creation? How do you make any individual mm -hmm. a Disney studio? And I think that's the great power. I think it's, it's not only selfish to like just build yourself a castle, it's just also just not intellectually interesting. Anyone can become rich and famous themselves. It's, it's really not hard, right? But to give that gift to the world and let the children run and make their own sandcastles is an impossible task. Hello and welcome back to the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. V, and I just want to say how grateful I am that you're on this journey with me. Today, with us, we have a very, very special guest, Bing Chen. He is an entrepreneur, creator, and founder of Gold House, the premier collective of Asian founders, creative voices, and leaders dedicated to unifying the world's largest populace, Asians, to enable more authentic multicultural representation and societal equity. Previously, he was YouTube's global head of creator development and management, where he was one of the original and principal architects of the multi-billion dollar influencer ecosystem. This guy helped build YouTube. He's a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree, a Hollywood reporter, next gen leader, as well as Magic Johnson's 32 under 32. He's won tons of awards. And today we really talk about the power of media, the power of media to shape the voices, the emotions, the landscape, the culture of who we are as people and how that relates to our health. You're not going to want to miss this. Ladies and gentlemen, Bing Chen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Bing Chen on the Thrive State Podcast. Bing, thanks for joining us. Dude, I, I'm bringing you on because of several reasons. One, you've got an awesome six pack and a built like, <laughs> like crazy. Fans want to know. Actually, my audience wants to know how you get there. So we're going to get to that in, in, a, in a second. You starve and you hate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, you know what? You have been so instrumental in kind of designing this new evolution of media that I'd like to, for you to talk about how media shapes our culture, because I'm going to tell you a story myself of, of how, how I got sick and it was through, you know, the media that was around me. And then lastly, how do we leverage the media to tell minority stories or my, you know, give out minority points? A little story about myself. I don't know if you know, but as a kid, uh -huh. I had wanted to be an actor. You know, and I was yeah. actually, I auditioned for The Last Emperor. In fact, my younger brother got the role. He played young Puyi in The Last Emperor. Wow. And yeah. he's now no longer your younger brother. <laughs> no, he's a pharmacist working at Kaiser. You showed him. <laughs> right. But I remember growing up with television and some of the movies there that there were, there were not any stories that told there were not any pictures or in, in the media that told stories of what I thought was was me. In fact, you know, I wanted to be, you know, somebody that had impact or influence, but the only people that looked like me on TV were, you know, people who only did martial arts. And I remember growing up, you know, just not liking my identity, being Asian. And, you know, I, I listened to my mom, became a doctor, but I used the white coat to hide that not enoughness I had. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of not feeling like you belong or that you're not enough and that you can't be who you are, that kind of stresses us out. And it, it led me four years ago to be overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, and I was on prescription medicines. And wow. it wasn't until I did some personal and really, really deep healing to really learn how to love myself and then know the things that it takes to actually live a healthy life that I was able to reverse all those conditions, which is why this is so important, I feel. Now, it's awesome. I'm, I'm about a decade your senior or so. <laughs> Tell me what we media- the same age. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? Till 105. Well, tell, me what, <laughs> tell me what media was like for you growing up. I mean, it started to change already, but tell me what it was like for you. And I, I remember reading that, you know, very early on, you had the dream of becoming the next Walt Disney. Tell us what that is about. Media has always been very fractured to me. And, and while I never saw, you know, I'd say many or any API leaders or even Asian leaders, yeah. I also didn't feel like I needed it. Now that could come from naivete of being blind and not knowing what you need because you don't have it. But I also think I just look at people at a very human level. And I think that's my job. And so since I was a child and my heroes were Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, I guess Gandhi is Asian, 
or was yeah. Adrian. So Gandhi, Gandhi would be the one. Uh, right. Mr. Rogers, you know, the Reading Rainbow dude, LeVar Burton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I just always gravitated towards them. And I think when I moved to Shanghai, you know, it didn't become any different. You know, our, our heroes just became Asian, but they still did incredible work for incredible human beings. So I would say in media, I, my, my experience was not as binary as it is for especially many Asian Americans where they crave to see the Asian superhero. Yeah. Asian male romantically that gets the girl, saves the world. I never had that need. I was always just moved by great people who led great movements. But yeah, so I, I guess I would start yeah. there. You mentioned wanting to build or wanting to be the next oh, Walt right. Disney. Where did that come from? When, when, when did that come from? How old were you at the yeah. time? And, you know, I think, you know, it's really, you know, come to fruition, but you, you've had this dream very, very early on. You're a very kind man. It is about to come to fruition, but it's been a long road. No, I think the, the impetus is really simple. I think twofold. And all things come both inductively and deductively. So inductively, I think like all of us, I felt different when I was young. I was one of three people in my school of color. Obviously, I never realized that until we moved to Shanghai when I was given a billion and a half reasons why I was not white, even though I thought I was. But I think just feeling different in a variety of ways makes you reconcile, well, who am I? Do I belong? Does anyone see me? And then at a deductive level, uh, and obviously I didn't think this as, as a 10 year old, but as I, as I matured, especially when I got into my teens and certainly into college, I realized that the only real way you can change the world is to build new worlds. Because the reality is, unless you play God with CRISPR and so forth, which by the way, I do support and I want all that to eradicate all disease, but I'm not smart enough to play there. Unless you do that, the only real way you can change lives is through nurturing, changing yeah. school, changing policy, changing how parents can better parent and become available uh, and accessible to their children, so forth and so on. And at the time, partly viscerally, but also partly just from an efficiency standpoint, I think the entertainment worlds do that more effectively yeah. than any other. And, and the moment that this really triggered for me was, uh, it was the second movie I ever saw, it's called Beauty and the Beast. And I remember seeing this like rose petal fall, which signaled the effectively end of a young man's life, but then in theory, the beginning of his new life with this girl named Belle, who's really smart and the best princess. And I remember seeing this and being like, wow, how is this artifice resonating with me? And it's at once a practical thing that exists on earth, but also does not because it's fictitious. Like, how do you engineer this world and how do you scale it to be amenable to everyone? So it was the first moment where I think a, mm. light, a light bulb went off. Obviously, as I became older, I realized building worlds is highly complex, it requires a lot of different work and a lot of resources, but I tried to do so through all my different work, whether it's at YouTube and creating you know, the biggest creator economy since cable TV, whether it's Gold House, where we're trying to galvanize the largest majority in the world, four and a half billion of Asians to serve and lead the world, or it's in my forthcoming holding company that is indeed trying to be the new Walt Disney company. So yeah, I think the net is worlds will save us, but it is incumbent on us to build them and not just accept the one that we are handed. Amazing. And when you were entering Penn, is this a reason why, because you wanted to be able to tell stories that you ended up choosing an English major and not going in, in, into business or something like that? It's exactly right. I mean, like all of us, I was such like a little shit in college. Like I chose Penn over Columbia because it was like number four on the US World News Report behind HYP and Columbia was nine. And I was like, well, I can't go to number nine. And so <laughs> like, all those lists are so, so silly anyway. So yeah, so I chose Penn because I, was, I looked at it partly for that. And then partly I realized somewhat salaciously that every major Hollywood studio chief graduated from one of three schools, Harvard, USC, or Penn. And I didn't apply to USC, I didn't apply to Harvard. And so I was like, okay, well, Penn it is. And 100% of them had English majors from the chairman of Disney at the time to Stacey Snyder, the CEO of DreamWorks with Steven Spielberg. And, and I asked them all, why would you do this? Because ostensibly an English major is useless. You know, it's like you right. can read and write well, which means your future is being a teacher, which by the way, my mother is a teacher. So all good and love respect to teachers, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. And so yeah, anyway, so I, I, I saw, but the, the, the practical value of it was one, it was the easiest major. So I could take a bunch of other stuff, which I love. But I think more importantly, all of life is about distilling abstraction and making it cogent and useful. And is that yeah. not what English is? Like you have to make a poem valuable. Like, is there not, is that not what we do every day? And so, yeah, it was the greatest decision I ever made. It ended up being immensely valuable. I wouldn't change a thing. I'm glad I listened to my advisors who are way smarter than me. And I highly recommend it for all the young folk. <laughs> So uh, I'm looking at what you're doing right now. Amazing the work that you're doing with, with Gold House and, and then now actually being close to becoming the next Walt Disney. When you said your initial moves out of college, I, I know you worked for Disney and then you ended up over in Google. 
did those moves make sense to you back then? Were you like, you know, I'm going to build the next Disney and, and therefore I, I, I am going to go through Disney and then I'm going to learn, you know, you know, tech and be in an environment where I can flourish there? Yes and no. So the, the honest answer is my end state has never changed. And I yeah. think that those of us who plan and have great conviction in our North Star, I think that's the case for all of us. Yeah. Now, the road there is incredibly tumultuous and unpredictable. And so the end state was, all right, if you want to be Walt Disney, what does that actually practically mean? Yeah. It means that you have to have incredible story sensibilities, but then you also have to understand how to create systems that deploy those stories and make them highly interactive, engaging, useful. And yeah. so, you know, when I was in college, if you want to be Disney, the first place you go to check all those boxes is Disney. So I entered there twice, as you just articulated. My claim to fame is my last project was a movie that ended up becoming Frozen. And I was the first person at Disney to touch it. I had a very provincial job on it, so it was not important, but but it was exciting. And I, I feel like I got an immense appreciation for how rigidly a machine needs to work to tell the most magnificent stories that are critically acclaimed, commercially profitable, but also just culturally indelible to you know young people like I was when I saw Beauty and the Beast. And I feel like I, I got that story experience well enough. The reason I went to Google was when I was graduating, there were basically two decisions, go to the mailroom in an agency or go to Disney or a studio like that, or be lucky enough, I should say, or go to tech. And this was the height of the largest economic recession in, in effectively our domestic history. I think our world's history, our unemployment rate for graduating seniors in my university was twice that of what it usually was. And I unfortunately am a somewhat practical Asian in some cases. I, I looked at the world and was like, all right, are you going to go to the place that pays more or pays less? And so that was one calculus. But then and the second calculus was as much as a 21 year old can portend I thought that the next Disney was not like a, and this is obvious now, but a decade and a half ago or so, a decade ago, like I didn't think that the next Disney was a walled garden. I thought it was a raised wall where you democratize not only the distribution of content, which we take for granted now, was yeah. not self-evident back then, but you also more importantly democratize creation. And I think that democratization of creation, which I call the God power, like yeah. how do you make wine from water? How do you give life to death? Like that's what's compelling. And there was no platform or company doing this better at the time than YouTube. Now, YouTube at the time was garbage. It was like getting sued by Viacom for $1.1 billion. Like it was, it was like my first YouTube video is Charlie and the Unicorn, which looks like someone on an Astatrip just decided to cobble together like, you know, pictures and clip art. But, but like the potential was so obvious. Mm -hmm. And and so I applied, I was very clear when to go to YouTube, I got very, very lucky and ended up being the only person in my university to get into the executive management program. Uh, which now long, no, no longer exists there because it's too expensive. And yeah, and I got an incredible opportunity to basically build with a bunch of others, the creator ecosystem as we know it, partly because we worked hard, partly because no one cared about it. <laughs> we were left to our own devices. What role did you feel like you, know, you had in terms of architecting this new creator community and platform for people? This wasn't something that existed before. It was major networks that decided what people saw and consumed. Yeah, correct. So back then YouTube wanted to be Netflix. I might get in trouble for saying that, but the <laughs> idea was like license a bunch of traditional premium content, use it as a Trojan horse to invest in original programming over time. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And at the level of an HBO, right? And remember, this is like pre House of Cars days. These are, this is like way, way back. And so I got there and I became the first creator marketing manager. And they basically said, being we have a bunch of like basically teenagers who are uploading videos on this platform. They're doing makeup tutorials and that one's name is Michelle. They're trying to do these like cute short rom-com films. That one's name is Phil, Wes and Ted. They're trying to do like rap. This one's name is Daystorm Power, like all the things. And they're like, we need to do something with them and we don't know. And so I, I had one official boss who was incredible. His name is Chris Hamilton. Um, but I had like several other de facto bosses named Margaret Healy, who managed the top 100 creators at the time, and Shana Zak, who is the lead product manager on the tech side. And they basically handed me this deck and we're like, we need you to do something. And so we, we had this deck and I called it internally like the Walt Disney of 2010, which is when we started. And in it was a studio system, global monetization, a talent incubator, like a global reward system in the form of a gold play button, like all these things. And I can go over the, the actual strategy, but the idea was like end to end, how do you develop more premium content? How do you distribute more effectively? How do you get credibility in mainstream media? And how do you sustain it through commercialization? And we ended up delivering on all of those 
those efforts except for one within two years. And within really two years, we took what was known as the partner program, which is basically just an advertising program into this massive creator ecosystem. And you saw just incredible momentum on Madison Ave with advertisers who started to take notice because we became a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, you started to see multi-channel networks as they're now known or, or were known, I should say, Maker Studios, Machinima, full screen and so forth, Style Hall, like start to birth to, to provide other services that we couldn't fill. But that's, that's effectively how it started. But the original impetus was how do you democratize creation? How do you make any individual mm. a Disney studio? And I think that's the great power. I think it's it's not only selfish to like just build yourself a castle, it's just also just not intellectually interesting. Anyone can become rich and famous themselves. It's, it's really not hard, right? But to give that gift to the world and let the children run and make their own sandcastles is an impossible task. And I think that's why like so many of us were so motivated and inspired by it. That's amazing because you know, we never used to see some of the stories and some of the perspectives, you know, in traditional mainstream media prior to YouTube. And then all of a sudden, you, the, the YouTube creator system happened. And then you're starting to see more people of color. You're starting to see new thoughts and ideas that were, were only of the minority, you know, come out. Was that all in the planning from, like you were saying, like from, from the get-go, you know, we, the YouTube you know, creator... A platform wants to democratize, you know, thoughts and ideas. It's an undulative process, as you know. So I'd say I'd be remiss if I omitted the fact that everything begins with creators themselves. Like even yeah. the term creators, when I got there, they were known as partners. And we were like, they call themselves creators. We call them creators. And now the industry calls them creators. When we got there, we noticed there are four communities in particular that were over indexing at the top of every major category. They were the Asian community, and I mean Asian broadly, not Asian American, the black community, the LGBTQ community, and certain categories, notably geek culture in the form of gaming and beauty and fashion. And the reason these were so compelling is, remember, this is pre fresh off the boat, crazy rotations, all that by a long yeah. shot. Mm -hmm. We realized that there was a disproportionately low amount of representation for these four communities in particular. The fourth one I know is the on bottling categories. And by virtue of that, when you are not seen in traditional media, you will find other outlets. And so a lot of these communities, especially the Asian diaspora, yeah. as you know, overpopulated on like MySpace and Zenga, and then moved over to YouTube. So th there was already this organic groundswell. Our yeah, job was yeah. to gas up the fire. And so to give you a practical example, um, the accelerator that I co-created called Next Up, which still endures to this day, and helped launch the careers of everyone from like Lindsey Sterling, the violinist, to Cassie Hill Blagalotti's, to like, I mean, Ingrid Nielsen, like you name it, uh, to Zach King, the filmmaker, we started to categorize that in the categories where we thought A, traditional media was under indexing or underperforming, but B, ones that were also globally resonant and useful, whether it was fitness, whether it was beauty or gaming or otherwise. Um, so, so it is an undulative sort of both side process. And, and like all things in life, it requires both. Mm, I see. Tell me now, what is the impetus of Gold House? Why is that out there now? T tell me how that arose. Like all things is also undulative. So inductively, there are a bunch of us in a room. It was not to name drop, but to give homage. So it was our co-founders, Kevin Lin, the founder of Twitch, uh, Brother Lin, who's vice chairman of Kate for Gold House, Janet Young, who's the highest ranking Asian in the Academy, and director John M. Chu, who at the time was contemplating this movie called Crazy Rich Asians. We were sitting in this room of basically a bunch of old Asians. And I won't say what organization it was. We were sitting there and I forgot who it was, but one of us started complaining, why don't we have what the black community and the Israeli community Yeah. Are? And we all immediately knew what they were talking about. So we were like, there, there's no instinctive and intrinsic source of mutual support within the Asian diaspora. Yeah. In fact, the first group to poo-poo Asians who succeed are fellow Asians, of course. And this is for all the reasons we can debate another time. And we just thought that was unacceptable because this wasn't a, just an imperative of, oh, well, the black community should only support the black community, the Israeli community should only support the Israeli community, so only we should support our own. It wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It was, there's a great source of strength in finding familiarity and concentricity with others. And we all have many versions of that concentricity, whether it's you and your wife, whether it's you and your children, you and your friends, or you and your community. And we realized that community piece is sorely lacking. And so as someone who I hate complaints, this comes from my mother, like I very, I have aggressive bias towards action. And I was also candidly the youngest and most junior person. So it fell to me to, to do the practical legwork. 
you know, within the past few years, we've built the definitive Asian mafia. We can talk about our impact, but we're really proud of what we've built with, you know, this just incredible global diaspora and collective, and we're definitely getting to where we want to be. The other impetus though, was we never built Gold House for Asians by Asians. This is not about Asian pride or Asian representation. In fact, if you read all of our materials, you will never see any language like that. It's always around the new majority. It's always around multiculturalism and so forth. The reason is a couple of fold. So I, I have the privilege of being a third culture kid. Even though time-wise it was not equivalent, I do attribute the way that I think and the way that I've benefited from the world to multiple continents and cultures. And, and when you have that privilege, you start to understand, I think a little bit more about A, how similar humans are and how concentric our needs are, but then B, also the promise that can come when we collaborate more efficiently. You know, like, like two is better than one as it were, yeah. e even if those two are thousands of miles away. And so the purpose of Gold House is not Asian representation, Asian success. It's how do you galvanize in a very structured, ritualistic way, 4.6 billion people, which is the majority in this world. We are the biggest, yeah. right? How do you galvanize all of us to serve and lead the world in useful ways? We are one of the oldest races, right? We have an immense amount of history of invention, whether it's you know from fireworks and paper all the way to Zoom and DoorDash. And so how do we lend that to the world so that the world accelerates and becomes a place that we all want faster? And it's not just in our own eyes and our own make, it's how do we become those conveners? And indeed, I think that's something that Gold House has tried to do. You know, we've gone out of our way from the early days to punctuate this, to engage our Black and Latinx counterparts, because this is the way the world is evolving, right? It is multicultural, yeah. it is biracial, it's mixed race and so forth. And so, yeah, that's that was the real impetus of Gold House. You know, it's amazing to me how the majority of the planet is still considered a minority in, in the media out there. You know why that is. Yeah. So it's amazing. How then do you think the way digital media is changing that more minority voices, and I'm not just talking about races, but like, you know, th there's minority thought. Like, for example, I believe that we are our best medicine. I don't believe prescriptions or, or the things that I got trained on. And I want to share that message. How do people with my either minority face or a minority thought or concept, you know, use the power of media then to kind of share their voices? So it's tough, right? Because I, we were talking about this with film recently and Netflix just like announced their massive, incredible like Academy Award laden slate of films for the year. And while the democratization of access through device accessibility, internet connectivity, like heightened middle classes, especially in like developing countries, like all the things, while a lot of that has made it more, made um, new voices or traditionally unsung or unheard voices more accessible, the reality is also neutralize their punctuation. Right? Like there is no like source of truth or pronouncement now. One of my favorite examples of this is Taylor Swift had the, the best performing album last year, but candidly, each one kind of emerged and then disappeared. Mm. And that's partly because of the pandemic, but it's also partly because there's just a lot of great stuff out there, you know, yeah. whether it's in the artistic world or otherwise. So good news is more people are seeing. Bad news is I worry not only about, is there going to be a single punctuated source of truth? And then also by virtue of that, like, what is the truth? And, and this is where, of course, like issues like fake news and so forth are able to run yeah. rampant because there is no authority anymore. Now, again, part of me is excited there's no authority because now we can have multiple gazes, but, but there's also a challenge there. So I think, our, I think the, the, the duty that's incumbent on us, and I think this is why focusing on ecosystem-based approaches as opposed to top-down draconian process is so important is how do you create systems where people can find their own way, but find their own way in a credible way in getting access to credible sources that are at least somewhat controlled? And I think that's that's a harder challenge that I don't know. I at least haven't figured out. Yeah, I was I was just going to ask you for the solution and what you thought the solution of that would be. Yeah, very uh, interesting. I mean, the the first place not yeah. to make it too like academic or esoteric. Like the first place you start with these big problems is you have to go really narrow, right? Yeah. So like my my focus is super narrow. I only focus on digital media, which is the nexus of entertainment technology and advertising. So like within like creative or informative experiences, how do we get people to like the best stuff that they want? as yeah. frequently as they can. Now, all the other considerations of like geopolitics, medicine, education, like I have no idea. Like, I, I, you know, that's your expertise, right? Maybe we'll get there at some point through collaboration, but I, I think you have to go narrow in, in what you know and what you feel like you can uniquely serve. Yeah. Let's bring up the, the concept. Did you, did you happen to see the social media on Netflix? I watched the first half hour. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you get some of the concept, right? I mean, we've got these devices that kind of, you know, sync our attention and be able to kind of steer our attention. Uh, how do you think consumers or, uh, you know, media consumers, you know, in the future, how do people actually maintain their own sovereignty in thought and not be lost in fake news or, 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 or things that, that might be kind of directing their attention? God, this is such a hard question, Dr. Wu. I mean, I think I think the the first point, the, the first practical point is the outlet. So it yeah. is absolutely incumbent on platforms to adhere to their terms of services and particularly adhere to at least objective truth. Now I'll 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 de demystify and how do you say tear apart what truth yeah. is in a moment, but there are certain things that are just objective facts that are not up for debate. And it's incumbent on these platforms to reinforce that. Donald Trump being able to persist for so long despite being a world leader on some of these platforms was a mistake. He should have yeah. been gone long ago because he is yeah. perpetuating actual lies, uh, which we still euphemize as falsehoods for some reason. Yeah. The second place though becomes, and th there's usually debate at the margins, and this is where truth starts to get very finicky and where opinions yep. you know, have to be heard and conversation needs to be had. I think here it's okay for things to run rampant. I think it's just incumbent on the platforms to create rails and context for that. So to give you a very provincial but practical example, if you're on Twitter and you see a debate, there should be some insignia that denotes that this is actually the fact. And then below this is where there's going to be debate. So at least, you know, through rails, okay, this part is definitely true. Some of this may be true, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where we start. So the platforms for sure. I think the second set are policies. This unfortunately is going to be really sluggish. No offense to the government, but all offense to the government. Policy <laughs> always trails societal cultural yeah. changes just because society and private sectors can move much faster for all the reasons we know. And I hope all of our young listeners go run for office and try to fix this. But policy would be the second place that we need to perpetuate this. Mm -hmm. And then finally is like personal life and parenthood. I don't believe that you can expect all humans to self-police. I think that's that's requiring people who are very busy, distracted, maybe trying to put food on the table, maybe trying to get their degree, maybe yeah. trying to hold three jobs. Like it's just too much. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why I say it's loud. But at the end of the day, this is incumbent on the individual. And I think this starts with parenting. I, we don't have to debate what a good parenthood looks like. You know, half of this country under the age, under the age of 18 as a single parent, often a single mother. I did. But you do need to have some form of mentorship that's consistent as you are engaging your formative years. And because that, as you know, will shape how you just see the yep. world and approach mm -hmm. the rest of your life. So I think those are probably the three. Oh, amazing. Now, Digressing from media a little bit, I, I've got my last two questions going down. I, I had a lot of fan questions, but we only have time for one. And, and it's coming from a, from a Kevin Kreider that we both know. Props to him, Asinova, Bling Empire Kevin. is about to launch on Netflix. And Kevin really wants to know, look, you are, you're obviously a very energetic guy. You look super fit. You're so eloquent and always on point. He wants to know, and I'm sure a lot of people also want to know, do you have a morning routine that puts you in the energy, the emotion, and the, the mental state that you, you know, come with every single day? Is there a morning routine that you go through? Uh, there definitely is. I think like everybody, it's it's not always consistent. And I think something is constantly being optimized. I would say the first thing to be annoying is the morning routine starts at night. Yeah. Like I have annual quarterly OKRs that I calibrate myself, my teams on and so forth. So I know where I'm going and, and when we're getting there. If we don't get there, then there'll be, there'll be issues. And I think that consistency with the end state of the North Star is where it yeah. has to be. I think the second thing is uh, I'm in bed pretty much at the same time every night. I don't subscribe to the bullshit of like, oh, like hustle porn. Like, let's get four hours of sleep and grind. Like I did that my first years at Google because everyone thought it was sexy and we're fucking idiots. It's like that's worse than smoking and, and just does not help anybody. So I get seven to eight hours of sleep without fail every night. I'm up at 7 a.m. There's no question every single day. I brush my teeth and I go like... I do a number two with my squatty potty and get everything out within 10 minutes. I do a 10 minute meditation that usually is based on abundance, just so that you can feel, feel like you're, you know, welcoming of the world. And then I have my matcha latte with oat milk that I just moved away from coffee in plus my Nero to, to kick me up. And then my days look pretty much identical, to be honest. First half I spend doing creative work and the second half I just spend doing my corporate company work. And then, you know, I go to the gym at the exact same time. I have supper meetings and then rinse and repeat. I realize that may sound a little monotonous, maybe not as monotonous as like a Tim Ferriss would make it, but probably more monotonous than a lot of other people. But I think I think structure is really important, especially yeah. when you're trying to execute a lot of things. So yeah, so that's the morning routine. It's not anything excessive or fancy. 
I don't like do affirmations anymore or anything like that, though I probably should. But yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, but yeah, I think energy, like the, the intrinsic energy and enthusiasm comes, doesn't really come from the morning routine, to be honest, Dr. Vu. Mm. Like it comes from genetics. So my, my mom and dad are incredibly ebullient and just like happy to be alive. Like, since I was young, I was very annoying. And I think secondly, partly genetics, but partly because of how I was nurtured and, and raised, my parents raised me to think that everything was a miracle and that it was within my control to create more of that all the way down to like, my parents almost never told me what to do. They would position things as choices. So I felt like I had agency, mm. like even things like that, you know, mm. made me believe that, wow, the world is wonderful, but imagine how much more wonderful it could be in blank, blank, blank. And I think that's just a perspective I bring everywhere. It's entirely because of my parents. And, and I think, I, I know not all of us have the privilege of doing that and the yeah. financial work, I'll do that. But the, the more that we can, I, I think not only the happier we are, but the, the greater the things we can build, you know? Yes. No, it's, it's, it's that energy of, I have enough, I am enough and, and everything is gravy. Such awesome points there. Last question for you, Bing, everything that's happened in your life, what would you say has been your best medicine? I would say that knowing that hope is a four letter word mm. is the best medicine. So let me tell that apart. So I don't really, and maybe I'm negative on this. I don't really subscribe to like oh, there's like always a way, everything happens for a reason. Like hope is the thing with feathers and you will be fine. And like, I think it's all bullshit. Like any, anyone who has ever had to weaponize hope has been in hell. Like it, they have absolutely been in like, they've had medical conditions as you just alluded to earlier. Like they've lost their job, they've lost a parent, they've lost like whatever it is. And they needed some source of hope that is very heavy to get out of it. Yeah. And I think that, I think it's partly because my mother especially when my father passed away, like mm -hmm. I know what hope is and I'm a res I'm relentless as hell because I know what it takes to get through things because I've been through it. And we all have, like we all are at war internally. Some of us just don't show it, right? And, and in fact, I think that well, those of us who survive the most are the ones who don't. And so I think that's the best thing. It's that like success, doing great things, all that comes with a price. And, and that price gets bigger and bigger, the greater ambition is. And so the question is, do you have the heavy hope to get through it? Or are you gonna defect and choose the role that was all traveled by everybody else? Uh, That's you know. beautiful. Hope, you're your best medicine. That's beautiful. Bing Chen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time, brother. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me on this episode. If you received value, I truly, truly appreciate it. If you could leave a five-star review, it will help the show grow. And I'd love to connect with you. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at KianVuMD. If you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State, at thrivestatebook.com. And remember, you are your best medicine.